Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to the third installment of the BMSC Research Seminar Series. Um, we're going to begin our seminar today with a quick introduction on um, the Banfield Marine Sciences Center, who we are. So we're a not-for-profit registered Canadian charity and a shared campus of the University of Alberta, University of British Columbia, University of Calgary, University of Victoria, and Simon Fraser University. Um, this seminar series was started years ago, maybe decades ago, um, as a great opportunity to learn from experts uh, in our community about the new discoveries being made in various fields of marine science. And it, it also supports our vision to create an open, collaborative, and approachable community of scientists at BMSC. So we wanted to keep this as an ongoing thing. Um, this is why we have it as an online uh, seminar series now. So keep tuning in throughout the summer to learn more about our um, alumni's research, our researchers' research, and other experts in marine science that we want to showcase. Um, if you like what we're doing and want to see more or get involved, please visit us at BanfieldMSC.com. So if you have any questions today, there will be a Q&A session at the end, and this is um, going to be pretty simple, managed by Dina herself. Um, if you have a question anytime during the seminar, you can put it into the Q&A session that you see, or section rather, that you see in your webinar interface. Um, you may not see your own question until we choose to answer it live. There's an option to answer it via text. So I may jump in there and answer some via text or not. So if you don't see it right away, don't worry. It has been asked. It will be answered if we can, um, if we have enough time to do so. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Dina Navon. Um, Dina's going to be talking about her research where nature met nurture, phenotypic plasticity in fish. So this is a really exciting talk. Um, just a little background about Dina. Um, she earned her doctorate from the University of Massachusetts Amherst, studying the evolution of plasticity in African cichlid fishes. Her research interests focus on the ways that various interactions build on one another to produce the stunning array of diversity that we see in nature. Um, Dina is also really passionate about science communication, which is excellent. Um, every scientist should be, if you can, um, as well as outreach and teaching. So Dina has written several blogs during her tenure at UMass and having taught um, a graduate level seminar in science communication for two years, she's becoming quite the expert on the subject. Um, she's currently working on a postdoc fellowship at the University of California, Riverside, supervised by Dr. Tim Hyam, uh, who's a researcher and um, faculty at BMSC, um, and Dr. Sean Rogers, who is a researcher and faculty at BMSC, as well as a um, as our director of BMSD. So um, she's going to be, I think, touching on her research today a little bit, investigating the genetic basis of behavior and behavioral integration in three-star three stickleback. Um, you may be wondering, how is Dina associated with BMSC other than through Tim Heim and Dr. Sean Rogers? Well, she's doing her research at BMSC. Um, we're very excited to have her, and this is how the BMSC staff and other researchers have been able to meet Dina and get to know her. And uh, this is why we're so excited to hear her speak today. So um, without further ado, I'm going to start Dina's video, mute my big mouth and- hey everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Hi Dina, um, and I'll stop my screen share here. Perfect, thank you so much for that introduction. Um, it's gonna take me a second to get my screen up, but um, give me two seconds. Hopefully everyone can see my screen now. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm really excited to be talking to you everyone today. Um, and thank you, Luke, again for that wonderful introduction. So today I wanna to talk actually mostly about the work that I did for my dissertation. Um, I'm gonna focus on phenotypic plasticity. And more specifically, I'm gonna focus on fish and cichlids in particular, because that's where I've done a lot of my research on this topic. I find plasticity to be a really exciting um, topic. If you've come to my talks before, you've probably heard some, some of this data before. Um, I am going to sort of give a little plug for what I've been doing here at BMSC at the end, um, but mostly I'm going to focus on some of the data that came out of my, my dissertation. But before we sort of dive into any of that, we need to step back and make sure that we're all on the same page defining these concepts in the same way. So I told you that I was going to talk about phenotypic plasticity, but I didn't really tell you what a phenotype is. So I define a phenotype as a set of observable characteristics produced by an indi individual through the interaction between its genotype and its environment. 
So I think best when I'm given examples for things. So what's an example of a phenotype that we can think about? Well, eye color is a really great one, right? So blue eyes is a phenotype. Um, and we often see a lot of variation in phenotypes. So you can have blue eyes, brown eyes, green eyes, gray, so on and so forth. And even within those categories, we also see variation. Now, this is a morphological phenotype. So it has to do with the size or the shape or the color of the, um, the organism. But we can also think about other kinds of phenotypes as well. So we can think about physiological phenotypes as you know, something like salinity tolerance or temperature tolerance. We can also think about behavioral phenotypes like this beaver that's building its dam. That's a really sort of striking behavioral phenotype. Why on earth would it do that? And I wanna point out that all of these kinds of phenotypes can be plastic. But what do I mean by plasticity? Well, plasticity is the ability of a single genotype or individual to produce multiple phenotypes when exposed to different environmental cues. So again, I like examples. What's an example of plasticity? Uh, here we have Daphnia. And these Daphnia are actually genetically identical individuals. So Daphnia can undergo clonal reproduction. They don't need to have uh, sexual reproduction in order to reproduce. So these are two genetically identical individuals, but obviously they look phenotypically completely different. And that's just based on the presence or absence of predators in their environment. Hey, Dina. And, yeah. Were you meaning to share your slides right now? I thought you were doing sort of a broad overview, but now I'm getting the idea that you're clicking between slides and just wanted to make sure that you are sharing your screen if you are. I thought I was sharing my screen. Sorry about that. Oh, okay. Bottom um, of the webinar page, there'll be a green share screen option. Uh -oh. And then when it opens up, you're going to have to choose the PowerPoint of all the different options that you see within there. Oh my gosh. Okay. Can you see my screen now? <laughs> yes, we can. And if you, oh, okay. if you just like shoot back a few slides, we were all listening intently enough to be able to um, you won't have to go, probably go through it again, but we'll be able to see the examples that you were giving. Yeah, okay. I'm so sorry about that. Thanks for jumping in. So this is what you should have been seeing from, from the get-go. Um, so here's my sort of intro slide. Uh, and when we're talking about um, phenotypes, here's the definition for you guys. Here's your blue-eyed individual, um, sort of variation in phenotypes that we were talking about. Um, and then this, this sort of beaver that's building its dam is a really striking behavioral phenotype. Now we're thinking about plasticity. And here's you have these Daphnia that are genetically identical. And that's kind of where we sort of broke off to, to make sure that everyone could see my screen. Um, so again, these are genetically identical individuals. Uh, they undergo clonal reproduction, but they phenotypically look completely different. And that's just based on the presence or absence of predators in their environment. And I hope you can guess <laughs> that it's probably obvious to you which one of these uh, and Daphnia actually grew up experiencing predators in, in its environment. Um, it's the left one, right? So it's got these, these sort of big spines on its head and, and its tail. Um, and it's probably pretty obvious to you why you would want to grow spines. If you encounter a predator, you can sort of ward them off with your spines or make it harder for them to, to actually eat you. But I want to point out that those spines are actually pretty costly to grow, right? They take resources. And so it makes sense that you would only want to express them in an environment where you're actually encountering predators. If you're not encountering any predators, there's no point to spend all those resources when you could be spending them elsewhere like reproduction. So in this case, I would say that the plasticity is pretty adaptive. You can express a beneficial phenotype when it's beneficial, but you can then save on those resources if that, if that phenotype won't help you very much. Now, I want to point out that we can find examples of plasticity across the tree of life. Um, so including invertebrates, here's an example from vertebrates. We have spade foot toad tadpoles that are exhibiting uh, omnivorous and carnivorous forms. And that is just due to the density of other tadpoles in their environment. So they start off small and as they grow bigger and if they're encountering lots of other tadpoles, um, they're, they're engaging in competition for food resources. Um, and so they decide to switch and become carnivorous and start eating the other tadpoles <laughs> instead of competing for resources. So it's sort of a way of escaping that comp competition. And there are other vertebrate examples as well. And I wanted to give you a fish example. So since we're going to be diving more into fish, um, which is appropriate for a marine station, um, 
Here we have fish pharyngeal jaws from a single species that's polymorphic for snail and plant-based diets. So again, I hope it's pretty obvious that the, the fish that's making its living off of crushing snails is going to have these sort of bigger, more robust um, pharyngeal jaws. And if you're not familiar with what pharyngeal jaws do, fish sort of have uh, decoupled the process of capturing the prey. So the oral jaws are predominantly going to be capturing the prey. They're going to get that food item into the mouth. And the pharyngeal jaws are actually in the back of the throat. And they're what does the majority of prey processing. So like crushing up that prey item so that it's then more easily digestible. And so again, if you're crushing snails, which have these heavy you know, calcified shells, you're going to want really big, thick plates that you can then use to sort of crush up those, um, those food items. So I want to point out all of these examples of plasticity are morphological in nature. And a lot of the work that I did focused on morphology. But other kinds of phenotypes can be plastic too. So we can see behavioral plasticity in humans. So for example, when we're cold, we don't necessarily grow thicker fur. We go and we put on a coat or fetch a blanket. And that's a great example of, of behavioral plasticity. Now, we can also think about physiological plasticity in terms of sort of acclimation to different salinities or temperatures, but I probably won't be talking very much about that because it's just not as infield for me. And I want to point out that not all species are plastic. So the ability to be plastic can actually come with a cost. And closely related species often differ in the amount or even the pattern of their plastic response with regards to a, a given trait. So how do we actually measure plasticity? Well, we use these handy diagrams called reaction norms. So this one here shows us that our first species is exhibiting a high trait value in the second environment, but a low trait value in the first environment. And so I would call this a pretty plastic species. It's got a nice uh, slope to that, to that reaction norm. And we can look at reaction norms in different closely related species. So for example, hypothetically, we could have a species that isn't really changing very much in response to its environment. So this is not a very plastic species. And in fact, we could have a third closely related species that actually shows a plastic response in the opposite direction as the first species. Now, this is a hypothetical example. I'm gonna be giving you a more real example in a little bit, but ultimately this difference in the pattern and magnitude of plasticity suggests that plasticity itself can evolve. Um, so in different populations or different species, you can have the plastic response changing, and that change is, is evolution. So we find plasticity in a lot of fish, and a familiar example, of course, is those pharyngeal jaws that I showed you earlier. Now, I want to point out that these jaws are actually taken from two individual wild-caught individuals. Um, so we don't know for sure whether diet was causing the changes to the pharyngeal jaws. It's entirely possible that these individuals were just different genetically, and that this wasn't actually a case of plasticity. But other research ultimately demonstrated that the fish of these this species, when fed different diets, developed different pharyngeal jaws in the way that we would expect. So when you feed um, these fish snails that have the shells attached, you get pharyngeal jaws that look, um, hopefully I can get my cursor up, that look more like um, the snail crushing fish. And when you feed those same, you know, siblings of, of that same species, uh, snails that have the shells removed, you get longer, sort of more, less robust um, pharyngeal jaws like you would expect to see from the plant eating snails. So I feel pretty confident saying that this is in fact a case of phenotypic plasticity and not just that there was some divergence um, between individuals of the same population that were causing these differences in the pharyngeal jaws. So what are some other examples of plasticity in fish? Well, Mexican cavefish are a great example of plasticity. Cavefish move into caves from surface populations um, and they really rapidly lose their eyesight. Um, and so these cavefish that I'm showing you here are all actually individuals from the same surface population. So they have the same genetic background, but they were raised in a low conductivity environment like the one that they would encounter if they had moved into a cave. Now this produced a range of eye sizes that mimics that difference between the cave fish and the surface fish. So we think that this plastic response might actually be behind the rapid loss in eyesight that we see when, when surface fish move into caves. Now here's another example of plasticity in fish. And this time is, it's an example of plasticity in a behavioral phenotype. 
So these fish were acclimated to different temperatures and their maximum speed shifted such that they were exhibiting their optimal speed at the temperature that they were actually acclimated to. And finally, one last example of, of um, plasticity, this time in stickleback. And this is actually an example from my undergraduate lab, but well before I was part of the lab. So I didn't actually have anything to do with this project, but it, being a part of that lab definitely sparked my interest in plasticity um, research. So what, what I'm showing you here is that these stickleback that were fed different diets were really changing their craniofacial shape. And I wanted to cycle back to diet changes and specifically this dietary axis because it's going to be a focus for the rest of the talk. But hopefully up until this point, I've convinced you that plasticity is a really complex trait. It can evolve, it's adaptive, and it's worthy of further study. So now let's dive a little bit deeper into this axis of variation that I just introduced. It's called the benthopelagic axis, and it refers to the area in which the fish are living, so their preferred habitat, as well as their preferred feeding mode. So aquatic habitats are heterogeneous. They, they differ based on where you are. And the benthic zone is just referring to the area along the sort of substrate of the lake or river or marine system that you happen to be in. And the pelagic zone is referring to sort of the open water column. Benthic fish that feed along the benthos tend to utilize like scraping or biting or plucking modes of feeding, whereas pelagic fish are predominantly suction and ram feeding. Now, I wanna point out that I will sometimes use the term limnetic and pelagic interchangeably. For the purposes of this talk, they just mean the open water column. So if you're feeding predominantly via suction feeding or feeding predominantly by uh, scraping or plucking. Now, here we see a benthic fish and a pelagic fish feeding. And I wanna point out that they're actually moving their jaws in pretty similar ways, right? So they're both opening their jaws and closing their jaws. Um, but they're loading their jaws really differently, right? And we can think about the benthic fish is loading its jaw because it's really pressing its face up against that rock. It has to maintain contact with the surface of the rock, and it's putting a lot of what we would call static load on its jaws in order to do that. The pelagic fish, it's a little bit harder to sort of think about how it's loading its jaws, but I want to sort of make the argument that it is in fact loading its jaws pretty heavily. So the pelagic fish is relying on suction feeding. And suction feeding requires you to open your mouth really fast and then close your mouth. And then continue doing that process over and over and over again. And so I would say that the, the pelagic fish is really relying on a, um, a cyclic load to its jaws where it's sort of rapidly and repeatedly doing the same motion over and over again. So I would challenge you to think that they're not just loading their jaws um, or, or less than each other, they're, they're actually just loading their jaws differently and, and responding to very different types of load. And we can often think about this axis as separating species or populations of a single species. So here we have char. Um, we think about different uh, fish that are falling along this axis. So here we have char. We can also think about stickleback. Um, we can think about cichlids, of course, <laughs> and ice fish and sunfish and, and lots and lots of other fish tend to fall along this axis, the common axis of variation in fish. And we can see differences that are reflected in various aspects of their anatomy. So even though these, these benthic fish are more closely related to their pelagic counterparts, they share common attributes so that their bodies are, tend to be deeper, their craniofacial profile tends to be steeper, their eyes are maybe a little bit smaller, um, there may be some changes to their fins, their jaws tend to be a little bit shorter. You can see that really well with the cichlids compared to their pelagic counterparts. So this brings me to one of the driving questions behind my research, which is what actually causes this pattern of evolutionary co-variation between traits? Because it's not common ancestry. These benthic fish are actually more closely related to their pelagic counterparts, but they share these common attributes with, with each other um, that separates them from their more closely related uh, species and populations. So we could think about it as maybe diet just has a really strong selective force on all of these various aspects of the anatomy. We could also think that maybe it's just that all of these fish are really plastic in all of their aspects of their morphology and are responding to diet in similar ways that are united by this sort of common plasticity. We could also think about it as being a little bit of both. And I would, I would like to hope that you come away from this talk as thinking that it's probably a little bit of both. 
And in fact, we do see a lot of morphological plasticity along this axis. So here we see a cichlid species, um, siblings from this species feeding either oops, uh, it's ground up and sort of sprinkled into the water column, or it's been ground up mixed with a little bit of a, a sticky gel and then spread over rock and presented to the fish that way. And so this species in particular is Trophyops red cheek. And I want to point out that while we can induce behavioral plasticity in this species, um, we can also induce the similar variation in behavior in the other two species that I'm going to be talking about, uh, Labiotrophus falborni and Melandia zebra. So they're all behaviorally plastic, but what's different about them is whether or not they can respond um, with their morphology as well. So we can think about how these animals fall along a specialist to generalist gradient. Now specialists are really good at doing one thing and one thing only. They don't like to branch out from that. Generalists, on the other hand, are proficient at many different things, and they can in fact switch between them at will. Now because all of our species will feed in both ways, none of them are completely specialized. But that said, Labiotrophus falborni or LF doesn't suction feed in the wild. It's only going to suction feed when you know it gets hungry enough and there's no other food being presented to it. Fine, it will suction feed at that point. But it is more specialized, I would say, than the other two. TRC and MZ are more generalist in nature, and specifically, TRC predominantly feeds benthically, but it'll suction feed sometimes if if you know that that's beneficial to it. And MZ falls sort of more along the, the pelagic side of the spectrum. It's more readily a suction feeder. Now, theor theory holds that plasticity and morphology should be really useful to our generalists because it helps the species be good at doing many different kinds of things. If they can change their behavior and then actually change their shape to match the behavior that they happen to be performing at a given time, that would be really useful to them. So that leads me to my first prediction for this work which is that our extreme specialists like LF will exhibit reduced plasticity compared to our more generalist species, MZ and TRC. And in fact, that's exactly what we see. So here we have LF fed benthically on the right and pelagically on the left. And you really can't distinguish between the two very much. There's not a whole lot of morphological change. I would say that these fish look pretty similar. And in fact, when we go in and actually quantify how their shape changes, going from one environment to the other. That's these arrows here. Yeah, there are some arrows, but they're not really moving very much. Those long and, you know, you're not changing your shape very much here. When we look at TRC, we see something completely different. So there's clear morphological differences. You can kind of see just in the picture. You have sort of a, a steepness of the craniofacial profile um, is getting steeper in the benthic treatment compared to the limnetic treatment. And when we look at that quantification of shape, and how it changes when you move from one environment to the other, we're seeing a lot more arrows. And again, sort of in the expected directions that that craniofacial profile is flattening out or not, and the jaws are getting longer or shorter. And that brings me to another overarching question underlying my, my PhD research, which is these two species have clear differences in whether or not they can be plastic. What's the genetic basis of that difference? And can we find the genes that lead to plasticity or the plasticity genes. Well, how on earth would we go around doing that? Well, my lab made use of a really awesome technique called QTL mapping. So that's quantitative trait loci mapping. Um, and it makes use of these two species that are differentially plastic but can still interbreed with one another. And so the basic idea behind a QTL is you take two things that differ in both your, your phenotype, so 10 versus six, that's your trait value, and genotypes, so you either have you know, gray alleles or black alleles. And you cross those two together to produce your F1 hybrids that are intermediate in both phenotype and in genotype. So they you know, have one chromosome from mom, one chromosome from dad, and they have um, a trait value of eight. You can then intercross that F1 population, which produces subsequent generations that have undergone recombination. And you can think of that as basically shuffling the genetic deck so that bits of mom's genome and bits of dad's genome are all stuck up next to each other. What that allows us to do is go in and actually phenotype all the hybrids and say, okay, well, this individual has this phenotype and that individual has that phenotype. And then scan across the genome, looking for areas where 
your genotype and your phenotype are closely associated. So like this locus here, where if you have two gray alleles, you look like your gray parent. If you have two black alleles, you look like your black parent. And if you have you know, one allele of each color, you look intermediate. And so that's what we did. Only we did that with our species that are differentially plastic. We then took the F3s and split them into different diet treatments. And we used those hybrids to assess plasticity in a bunch of different parts of their morphology, including their craniofacial shape, um, fin traits like the muscle and, and muscle shape and fin, fin ray counts, um, their body shape, the shape of their pharyngeal jaws, and their gill raker lengths and counts, which again, all of these are aspects of the anatomy that we would expect to be important for feeding. We ran a, a um, statistical analysis that helped give us um, a benthopelagic axis um, in which extreme scores on either end of the, the axis represent extreme shapes of that, uh, of that treatment. So scores along this axis were able to accurately classify our individuals back to that group that they were supposed to belong to. Now, I wanna point out that some traits were better at this than others. Um, and in particular, our fin musculature was not very good at reclassifying our individuals to the group that they were supposed to belong to. But for the rest of the talk, these scores were used as a proxy for plasticity, such that if you were extreme um, on the benthic side of the spectrum, you were considered to be more plastic than if you were in the middle. And if you were extreme on the um, plastic side of the, the axis, you were, again, considered to be more plastic than, than scores in the middle. Now, here's how the, the scores actually translate back into shapes. So our extreme benthic shapes are on the, excuse me, on the left. Our extreme pelagic shapes are on the right. And overall, these, these shapes are following those stereotypical changes that we saw along the benthopelagic axis. So our benthic fish are showing, you know, steeper craniofacial profiles, deeper bodies, deeper heads, um, wider jaws more robust pharyngeal jaw structures. Although again, that sort of oddball was the fin musculature wasn't really doing what I would expect it to be doing. But we wanted to look at how those changes in shape were related across our individuals. So in other words, if you're a hybrid fish and you scored extremely benthic in your pharyngeal jaws, are you also scoring extremely benthic in your overall body shape or your you know, craniofacial shape and so on? Were these traits related at the morphological level? And here's a visualization of which traits actually correlated with each other this way. And I wanna point out that we see a lot of covariation, but it separates out so that the gill rakers are kind of doing one thing and there's a bunch of other traits that are related to each other. And then the pharyngeal jaws are kind of on their own. And we can imagine that a single gene controls the plastic response for all, for all of the traits in this unit. And another gene controls the plastic response for all the traits in this unit and a third gene you know, controls the, the uh, plastic response for the pharyngeal jaws. And that hypothesis has the benefit of being really simple, right? It's parsimonious. Um, but we didn't actually know for sure that that was what was going on. So we wanted to ask what causes this correlation between the plastic responses at the morphological level? Is it that the same genes are controlling those suites of traits? But when we laid out all of the loci that underlie plasticity in these traits and then mapped them onto a schematic of the genome, we actually see something quite different. There's really not a lot of overlap um, and really just these two instances where traits from different you know, anatomical units are overlapping with each other in their genetic control. And when we visualize those relationships, but using the, the genetic scores as opposed to the shape scores, um, what we can see is that while the gill rakers tend to have similar genetic control, all the other relationships really break apart with, with one you know, rare exception here. So all of this tells us quite a bit about the relationships between various plastic units. And what I want the takeaway to be here is that these traits can be, and plasticity in these traits are related at the shape level, but not necessarily at the genetic level. But it still doesn't get us down to the level of really knowing which genes control whether or not we can mount a plastic response. So for that, we wanted to focus specifically on craniofacial plasticity because it was really a focus for the lab that I was in at the time, and also because it's a really tractable trait that we can think about. And we knew that, again, TRC had the capacity to remodel its craniofacial skeleton based on diet, but that LF didn't. We believed that this global remodeling 
likely came about through localized differences in how bone was being deposited. And we were pretty sure that there was some sort of genetic basis for that ability. Um, but we wanted to really get down to the molecular and tissue level mechanisms that cause these shape differences in TRC. And so in order to do that, we used a technique to quantify bone deposition. Here's how we did that. First, we split the fish into our different diet treatments, and we allowed them to adjust to that new feeding style. Then we labeled the bone by injecting with a fluorochrome. Now, fluorochromes get bound to calcium as the bone's being deposited, and so that lays down a really nice um, fluorescent band of color that we can then go on and, and, and look at later. So we labeled them first with a red fluorochrome, then we waited a few weeks and let them feed on those different diet treatments, labeled them again with a different color, we waited another week for that bone to be sort of incorporated, and then we sacrificed the fish. We dissected out a whole host of genes of bones of interest, and then we simply measured bone deposition as the space between those labels. Um, this is a really slick technique for, for doing this. Um, it's, it's tricky to, to do it, but once you sort of get the hang of it, it's a really easy thing that you can do in, in many different kinds of fish, which was great. So, like I said, we measured bone deposition just as you know, quantifying the space between the labels. And then we use those raw data to generate reaction norms like, like the ones you saw before um, that, that tell us how much bone is being deposited in each treatment. So what does the data say about how bone deposition changes in various treatments in our different species? Well, let's look first at the interoperable. I'm gonna focus on that as one of the main bones of interest um, because it, it's a really key link in the, in the fish uh, craniofacial system. Um, it helps translate force from the back of the head to the front of the head, um, and it's overall just a really sort of important bone. So what are the data? Well, these are two GRC siblings, and we can see a really nice uh, increase in bone deposition in the benthic treatment relative to the pelagic treatment. Now, this is reflected in our reaction norms when we look at sort of average bone deposition in each treatment. Again, we see a really nice plastic response. And when we look at our other generalist species, right, MZ, what we actually see is the opposite pattern. Our pelagic fish are showing increased bone deposition relative to our benthic fish. And we believe that this difference might be due to the fact that MZ kind of falls back to closer to that pelagic side of the spectrum than TRC does. If you think back to Go to the beginning of the talk when we were talking about where they fall along that benthic um, to pelagic and, and specialist to generalist gradient. MZ was a generalist, but it was more on that pelagic side of the spectrum. So we think that it's just primed to respond to that cyclic loading cue that that pelagic fish experience. But when we looked at our specialist species, LF, we did see no significant difference between the treatments. And that's a really familiar looking figure, right? We kind of recapitulated that hypothetical response, which is really cool. Very excited about that. But that wasn't the only bone in the face that we looked at. So we did this for many bones. And here you're seeing the p-values for the difference between the treatments. Um, so where you have you know, 0 0.20, that's just a p-value. And where you see this green color, it means that benthic um, fish are upregulating bone deposition relative to pelagic fish. Where you see this purple color, you're seeing you know, pelagic fish are upregulating bone deposition relative to our benthic fish. And where you see no color, you're seeing no significant difference between the treatments. And so overall, there was a really striking pattern such that TRC was consistently upregulating bone deposition in that benthic treatment, MZ was doing the opposite, and LF really wasn't changing how it was depositing bone depending on its treatment at all. So we feel pretty confident about this being the tissue level mechanism that leads to those global shape changes, that they're just changing how they deposit bone. Well, I promised you, I was gonna tell you a little bit about the molecular mechanism. So what is the molecular mechanism? Well, going back to that QTL experiment that we did, where we looked at for an association between genotype and phenotype, one of the genes that sort of popped out in that analysis was a gene called patch one. And we found that gene to be particularly interesting, and here's why. So patch one is a key receptor in the hedgehog pathway. And what do we know about hedgehog signaling and craniofacial shape? Well, hedgehog signaling is known to influence craniofacial shape, especially in the interoperable. So again, that sort of key bone in the face that I was telling you about. So here is a fish that has um, sort of normal hedgehog expression, 
But when we manipulate hedgehog expression using small molecules, we've changed the shape of that bone. And I want to point out that those changes sort of mimic the differences between our species. So here we have LF that hasn't been treated at all. Here's LF that's been treated with, with ethanol as a, as a sort of negative control. And here's LF that's been treated with that small molecule. And it is changing its, its uh, trait to more closely mimic what we see in MZ. So hedgehog signaling influences craniofacial shape. But that's not the only reason we were excited about it. It's also associated with gaping. Now, gaping is a developmental behavior um, that I can hopefully play for you here. Yes. Um, that involves this rapid and opening and closing of the jaws during development. Now, when we look at that fish, the first thing I would think is that it's panting, right? Like, a, like an animal that's being, you know, run really fast. It's just, <sighs> but I want to point out that actually, um, sorry, breathing isn't really happening at this stage through the mouth at all. So gas exchange at this stage of their development is mainly occurring through the skin and specifically the skin on their sort of yolk sac. So what on earth is going on? Why would, would they be rapidly and repeatedly moving their jaws if they don't have to waste the energy to do that? Well, I wanna point out that that movement mimics that cyclic load that we've been discussing throughout this talk. Um, and it may in fact be priming the fish to develop the jaws that are most appropriate for their species. A very talented lab mate of mine went in and actually showed that different species gape at different frequencies. And even more than that, when you experimentally force them to change how fast they're, they're gaping, their uh, jaw shape is actually also uh, impacted. And even more than that, those differences in gaping frequency and jaw shape also coincided with differential patch one expression in those same fish as measured by quantitative PCR. So all of this points to hedgehog signaling being a key mediator of jaw development in cichlids. And we wanted to test that hypothesis that it's also involved in the plastic response. So we ran a similar experiment as before, where we split our different fish into different diet treatments, and we looked for differences in patch one expression across treatments using qPCR. And we found a significant difference in the expected direction. So in MZ, we expected to see that um, it would be upregulating patch one expression in the same treatment that it was upregulating bone uh, deposition. So the pelagic treatment for MZ, the benthic treatment for TRC. And that's exactly what we see. Um, these fish, the MZs, are, are, uh, have more bone deposition in the pelagic treatment and also have more patch one expression in that pelagic treatment. And the opposite is true for TRC. But this data is just correlative. It doesn't actually tell us whether or not that uh, change in, in gene expression functionally causes uh, the, the change in the, the plastic response. So we wanted to more explicitly test that hypothesis that hedgehog signaling is mediating this plastic response in teleops. And we couldn't do that in cichlids because it would be really hard to do, but we switched to a different uh, fish, which is zebrafish. So we, ran a, we knew that we could induce similar behavioral variation in zebrafish as in cichlids, right? So we could force them to feed benthically or pelagically, and you're gonna see that here. Here they're feeding pelagically, which is more what they would do in the wild. And here they're feeding benthically, which for us was just really cool that we could get them to do this because uh, zebrafish don't really have teeth in the traditional sense. Um, so the fact that we could force them to scrape off of a tile was really, really exciting. Um, and when we looked at how these fish changed their shape in response to these different diet treatments, we did in fact see that there were, there were changes to their, their craniofacial shape in the expected directions, again, so that our benthic fish are, are um, sort of exhibiting a, a steeper craniofacial profile, and that's more flat in the, in the pelagic fish. So all of this said that we, we could do this experiment in, in our zebrafish, and we were able to make use of some pre-existing transgenic lines where zebrafish um, had been uh, changed so that we could turn up or turn down hedgehog signaling in those fish at a, at a specific time point in their development. So again, we thought that the hedgehog pathway would mediate this craniofacial response. And we knew that wild type zebrafish are pelagic feeders. So we expected to see that they would have a response that's similar to our MZ fish so that um, they are upregulating bone deposition in the pelagic treatment. And we also believe that we would find that key role for hedgehog signaling in this response 
so that if we turned down hedgehog signaling, we'd see a flattening of that reaction norm. And if we turned up hedgehog signaling, we hoped we would find an amplification of that reaction norm. So I'll present the data similarly as I did before with those uh, reaction norms. And here's just the prediction. Sorry, I forgot to populate them. Um, decreasing hedgehog signaling will, will dampen that response, but increasing it will amplify that response. And when we looked at the interopical, which again is one of those places that we know is really important to feeding, and we also know is probably um, important with, with respect to hedgehog signaling, we do find a nice wild type response in the way that we would expect, such that our pelagic fish are depositing more bone than our benthic fish. And when we knock down hedgehog signaling, we actually see that go away. That response goes away completely. Um, and when we knock up hedgehog signaling, at least in that, um, in that particular bone, we did manage to find an amplification of that uh, response. Again, this isn't the only bone that we did this in. What does what the bones do? Well, again, here are the uh, p-values for the difference between the treatments. And our wild type fish are showing a nice, pretty consistent uh, response such that bone deposition is upregulated in our pelagic treatment. When we turn down hedgehog signaling, with almost no exception, that response just goes away. Um, there's still somewhat of a response in the optical, but it, it definitely gets dampened. And when we turn up hedgehog signaling, it's just in the interopical that we see a, a increase in that response or, or an increase in the, in the slope of that um, reaction norm. But overall, um, especially since when we looked at our cichlids that have different patch one alleles, MZ and TRC actually share a patch one allele and they both exhibit plasticity, but LF has a different patch one allele and it doesn't show that plasticity. Overall, we feel fairly confident saying that we've nailed down both the tissue level and the molecular mechanism of this plastic response. So what have we learned today? I know that's a lot. <laughs> um, and I wanted to just sort of summarize and bring it all back together and remind everyone of a few of the key conclusions that I want you to take away. First of all, I hope that you can appreciate that plasticity is a really complex trait that's worthy of further study. It's widespread, it's adaptable, it's evolvable, and it has a discrete genetic basis that we can really examine and dig into. Next, I want to point out that plasticity um, and plastic responses in different traits can be coupled at a morphological le level, but under distinct genetic control. It's a really cool finding. And finally, I want to point out that the hedgehog pathway and hedgehog signaling is a key regulator of this craniofacial plastic response in fish. Now, Today I told you a lot about the research for my dissertation. Some of it's been published already, some of it's about to be published, but I haven't told you much about what I've been doing for the last year. So I wanna give a little bit of plug um, for those of you, and, and as Luke pointed out, I've been working on a postdoctoral project here at BMSC, and I wanna give you a little snapshot of that work and sort of tell you what's coming down the pipeline for that. So that work focuses on the genetic ba uh, basis of behavior in stickleback. Now, the stickleback story, for those of you who don't know, is that about 10 to 12,000 years ago, um, these fish rapidly and repeatedly invaded freshwater habitats from a marine ancestor population. Um, so this was after the, the, uh, those freshwater habitats were opening up after glaciation. Now, those new populations sort of ran off along a number of evolutionary trajectories. And this produced a stunning adaptive radiation with populations that are all different in phenotype but still capable of being crossed in the lab today, despite having that geographic separation. Now, usually when we think about stickleback, we focus in on sort of the morphological differences like changes to body shape or craniofacial shape or the presence or absence of a pelvic girdle and pelvic spines or variation in lateral plate number. There's been a lot of research done on how these populations are different in, in their, uh, their morphological phenotypes. But we know relatively little about how those uh, shifts in behavior occur across these populations. So in terms of behavioral variation, I'm really interested in feeding behavior because it's hugely important for fitness. So here's a fish that is going to successfully feed on a prey item. And obviously it's really important because it's going to be able to have the resources for survival and reproduction. Um, and when you sort of fail in that task, you don't get those resources. And I think it's, it's both fun and, and really neat to see sort of a failure of that. And in a lab environment, oh, sorry. Let's see if 
I chose the wrong video. Possible. Oh, yeah. So in a lab environment, that fish might have a second chance at that prey atom. Um, but in a, in a sort of more competitive environment, it may not be able to actually feed successfully on that prey item by missing it in the first shot. So I want to point out that these fish have to move a lot of different parts and also coordinate between them in order to accomplish its goal. So it's moving a lot of parts in its face, but it's also having to move its body and move its fins in very specific ways. And it has to coordinate the movement between those different systems in order to sort of achieve this task of feeding. Now, different prey can offer different challenges. So this live prey, which is really hard to see, but <laughs> does actually exist. You can see it pointed out in the, uh, in the diagram there. Um, this live prey item that's actively evading the, the fish might offer a really different challenge um, to this animal. And so there's a lot that we still don't know about sort of the evolution and development of fish feeding behavior, the integration between different anatomical systems, and whether or not there's plasticity with respect to prey types. So stay tuned for a lot more on this subject, but as a quick preview, we are in fact finding some evidence of behavioral plasticity in these fish. And I wanna draw your attention specifically to these Cerita, Cerita Falls fish. Um, so these fish live in a really challenging environment, which is exactly where we might expect to see plasticity, right? Because it's good for um, fish that are having trouble finding food so they can feed on sort of anything um, would be very useful to them. And so we are in fact seeing a nice plastic response in, in response to behavior, uh, in response to prey type there. So with that, um, I'm happy to take any questions. Oops, sorry. And I definitely want to thank all my funding sources, members of the Albertson lab, members of the, the Hyam and, and uh, Rogers lab. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm happy to take any, any sort of questions that you might have. Hi, Daniel, thanks, thanks for uh, coming in. Um, so the question that was asked was whether I observed plasticity in the later life stages of the fish or if I observed any interchange between the benthic and pelagic phenotypes. So um, the first part of your question, I mean, these fish were all like juvenile, but close to adult stages. They were about to become reproductively active. Um, so they are kind of in a later life stage already. Um, and we deliberately kept um, the tanks separate so that our pelagic fish and our benthic fish weren't really um, interacting with one another. So uh, it wasn't like they were given sort of the opportunity to feed on one or the other. We sort of forced them into it on purpose um, in order to sort of get at the uh, mechanisms there. But um, I will say that we tried to do sort of a food choice, diet choice experiment that that has gone absolutely nowhere. We got a ton of data that we just couldn't make any sense of. Um, and I think that's all still sitting in the lab. <laughs> we haven't really done anything with it, but that's a great, great question. Hey, Dina, while we wait for um, a few other questions to come in, maybe I'll promo the next week's talk and thank you just in advance for how great of a talk that was and thank you so much for um, taking the time out of your day to do it for us yeah no problem i'm happy to be here and yeah please go ahead and, and promo the next next week's speaker okay great um i will have to i think stop your share screen That's there fine. we go Okay, so anyone with questions, please type them in um, while you're also paying very careful attention to um, our slide about next week's talk. Multitasking at its best. <laughs> Thank you, Dina. So this is Dina's lab. Dina um, can be found in Bloomingsville, <laughs> hiding in the lab. Um, Next week we have, uh, or not next week, I'm sorry, um, forgive me. We're actually um, on hi hiatus next week um, on June 23rd, that's two weeks from today. Please join us for Dr. Julia Baum, um, who will be speaking on fish and coral responses to marine heat waves. So um, to sign up for this talk, 
please pre-register at um, go to bamfieldmsc.com. Scroll a little bit down, uh, you'll get to the sort of the news section of the homepage and you'll find um, a place where we're promoting these talks and you'll be able to click the Zoom link to register yourself for the talk so you'll receive a, a reminder and be able to join through Zoom rather than YouTube. Of course, you can always join uh, on June 23rd at 1.30 right on YouTube Live without pre-registering. The, the same things will be available there. Um, but just make sure you set an alarm for yourself or put it in your calendar now if that's the way you want to do it. Um, and if you have questions about the seminar series at all, you can also type them in the Q&A section and I'll answer them by text while Dina's answering live. Um, well, this is the sign of a really good talk. Oh, okay, we have a question here. <laughs> I was going to say, it's a really me. good talk. If no one has questions, it means that no wonder your defense was successful. Yeah, it's actually not uncommon. I've, I've done to, um, I've done a, a bunch of seminar talks where I just haven't gotten <laughs> any, any questions, which I feel like I've stunned people into silence, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Stacy asks, uh, you know, we talked a little bit ago about my work and, and your experience moving along my academic journey. Um, and she loved my insights into the value of scientific communication and the different kinds of scientific communication there that there are. Um, and asked whether or not I would feel like recapping that for the benefit of this audience. <laughs> I would love to talk a little bit about my, my SciComm journey. Um, it has been a, a real sort of roller coaster, but it, it really helps sustain me as a graduate student. And I think it makes me a much better uh, scientist, researcher, communicator um, overall. And I think that those skills are not just applicable to sort of outreach, which is what everyone couches it as, right? If you're doing science communication, you must be talking to, you know, grandma at Thanksgiving or <laughs> writing blogs for sort of a public audience. But I wanna sort of make the, the uh, pitch that it's actually also those skills are translating into how you are as a communicator of your science, just writ large. Um, and it, it can help you sort of become a better communicator to other scientists, um, which I think is increasingly important as, as sort of fields become ever more specialized. We also need people who can reach across those different fields. Um, so I think that that went a little bit into it. Um, but yeah, if you have the opportunity as a grad student or you know an undergrad to take courses in science communication, you have the chance to start writing for, for blogs. Um, I know that there are a couple of science journals now. Um, Evolution is one. I wrote a digest for them where you basically pick one of their current topics and write about it um, as you know for a, a more lay audience. And that experience, first of all, gets you published, which is awesome um, if you're you're hoping to move forward in the field, but it also gives you a lot of experience sort of thinking about how to pitch research to a more broad audience. And Dina, I just found out um, that at 152, so during your talk, we received positive response from an invited speaker, Dr. Don Levitan, who's a researcher at BMSC, and he will be doing the June 16th seminar next week. So. We actually do invite everyone watching this to participate next week. And then two weeks from now, we'll have Julia Baum. Um, and then we have an exciting lineup set up for the rest of the summer. So um, we'll be sending information and links on how to sign up for both of those seminars shortly. Um, and please check our homepage as well if you don't receive it by email. But my guess is if you're in this as a participant, you've probably um, signed up for our subscription mail list and you'll receive this information. Um, sorry, that was like, yeah, we're, our hiatus has been canceled next week. We've got Don Levitan, and I remember that um, seminar he gave a couple years ago. Um, it's one of the most memorable ones I've ever seen, and it talked about urchin um, size versus age. So size is a predictor variable, and things like hundreds of years old urchins, like, just blew my mind. <laughs> Sounds really cool. Awesome. Do we, have, do we have any more questions for Dina from anyone? Okay, well, Dina's contact information is on our website as well. So you can always reach out um, via email if you have questions about her research. And I want to thank everyone so much for joining and participating in this. And um, we hope to see you again next time. Thank you, Dina.
Yeah, thank you. It was great, have, great being here. Thank you so much. Okay, bye-bye. Hey.